Okay, well, thanks for coming. As you can see, it's a very pretentious title. <laughs> But basically what I want to do here, I want to talk a little bit about this language because uh, unlike Bantu, which everybody knows, not many people know about this, right? So I, uh, no, it's not Bantu. So that's what I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about this language in general and then about our project, uh, which includes Tundra Nenets as one of the languages, okay? So that's the uh, genetic tree of Uralic languages taken from the internet somewhere. And uh, Tundra Nenet sits this part uh, in that group. It's part of the Samoyedic subgroup of Uralic. And as you can see, there are many other languages related. Uh, but the Samoyedic group, it's probably the most eastern uh, and the most northern uh, subgroup of Uralic languages. The better known Uralic languages include uh, Finnish and Hungarian, which Hungarian is here, Finnish is there, but the, they're spoken in the European part of Russia and Europe. And uh, this branch, Samoyedic branch, uh, where Tundra Nenets belongs, uh, they're mostly spoken in the Asian part of Russia in Siberia, basically in Western Siberia, so which is behind the Ural Mountains. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's another uh, map. It actually looks very nice, except that you can't see it very well on this slide. But the map itself is beautiful, and it was compiled by the Finno-Ugric Society in, in Finland. Where, that's where I took it from. And that's the area where you, the Uralic languages are spoken, as you can see here. The Samoyedic languages are in that part. Yeah, so that's the northern part um, of European Russia. and. Uh, Western Siberia, a lot of it is behind the polar circle. Okay, oh. so that's the Tundra Nenets. And that's a very, very vast area, mm, as you can see here, which doesn't actually do the justice uh, to this language because uh, there aren't that many speakers, in fact. Um, mm, well, there are various estimates, but probably currently about 20,000 speakers and obviously the language is highly endangered but the area is still vast and it's vast for the for the reason that uh, well basically it's tundra right uh, which means very 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 huge flat land and uh, nomadic cultures okay i can show you a couple of pictures these are my own pictures that's how the typical tundra nenets, nenets village looks like in the summer and that's my, my own picture taken a few, a few years ago. Uh, that's the village of Nelmen Nos, spoken in that, that area roughly. Um, and as you can see here, it's very, very flat. So it's just uh, these buildings in the middle of no, nowhere. And then you have miles and miles and miles of tundra with pretty much nothing. Yeah, that's another one. You, you, you can see here that it's a very vast land. And that's another picture of tundra. So that, that uh, obviously in, in winter it's covered with snow. But look at this white stuff. What do you think it is? That's not winter, okay? It's not snow. Huh? Not exactly, but close. Huh? Lichen, exactly. So that's the, the moss, the, uh, it's called lichen in English, uh, as far as I know, which is the main uh, food for reindeer. And that's why it's extremely important uh, for the Tundernet's culture, because reindeer breeding is the most important uh, activity, tra traditional activity, let's put it this way, for these people. That's how it looks uh, if, you, uh, if you look at it closer. So basically, the, Tundra is covered with this lichen, and um, once reindeer eat up, you know, uh, all the food in a particular area, then of course you have to, you have to migrate to the to the new area, and that's the basis of their traditional economy. Of course, now uh, most of the Tundra Nenets people 
do not nomadize. They live in these little villages, which I which I show you, showed you. Yeah, that's how it looks like. Uh, and only some families are still living the traditional lifestyle and uh, semi-nomadic lifestyle. I, I, I would suggest. So they migrate with their reindeer. So that's, by the way, the reindeer sled, the, the, the summer sled, so, so to say. They, they have different types of sleds for winter and for summer. This, this is actually lighter, obviously, because it's more difficult to drag a sled when there is no snow. Um, so that, that picture it captures the moment when the reindeer breeders actually visited the village to buy stuff from the local shop and then they just go away with the mm, sleds. And that's how the people look <laughs> like. Um, that's one of the speakers of the language. Uh, he's a, well, the actual truth and the next, uh, person because he practices the traditional um, activity, reindeer breeding. Um, yeah, that's another picture of the the people. That's an, that, uh, this is taken in the village. That's just how our language consultants uh, look like. And finally, another one. <laughs> but only half of these people are nenets, as, as, as you can see. <laughs> the other half is not. But this uh, this is the traditional uh, clothing, traditional patterns. As you can guess, they imitate what reindeer antlers. Yeah. So basic, ba basically everything. The traditional, uh, you know, e economy, uh, art. Uh, it, it it all goes around re reindeer breeding. Okay. Um, now the language, as I said, uh, is highly endangered because. Uh, well, it varies from area to uh, from one area to another area. As I said, uh, it, it covers huge area, and the so socio linguistic situation in different parts of the Nenets area uh, they, they, they're slightly dif different. In some parts, the uh, knowledge of the language is much higher than in other parts. And obviously, the more to the north you you, you go, the better uh, the language proficiency is. But more to the south, when obviously there is more contact with the Russian language, and especially with the uh, the people who are involved in all sort of um, you know oil and gas uh, gas uh, developments in the Nenets land, then the level of proficiency of the Nenets goes down significantly uh, to the extent that the the youngest speakers are probably all over 60, okay? And the children do not re really learn the language. But language is, the language is not uh, undescribed and it's not undocumented. There, are, there is quite a lot of research. Uh, there is grammar, uh, quite a lot of grammatical studies, good dictionaries, and so we know, we know, we know pretty much uh, everything about this language uh, but what is mostly interesting is that you can actually hear it on the internet these days and I want to refer to these two sources which I think are just wonderful that one um, gives you a phrase book where you can find like ev 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 everyday language and uh, unfortunately it's in Russian but with, with some English explana explanation but you, you can hear the language uh, sentence by sentence and this one is a collection of texts that one is mostly meant for for the learners of the language right and this is mostly meant for linguists so that's the collection of texts with linguistic analysis uh, glosses uh, and some additional information and the that's quite a useful resource, I would say, because you can actually do search there, and you can search for a particular grammatical feature uh, if you want to. Okay, so that's the basic introduction into the language. Now, why am I actually studying this language? Well, it has a lot of interesting uh, stuff in its grammar, and in particular the phenomenon at which we are looking 
within this project um, called Prominent Internal Possessors. And that's uh, our project which was uh, funded by AHSC and it started now a, a year and a half ago and goes for three uh, years until November 2018. Um, it's hosted here at SOAS and as you can see it involves these four people. Uh, so myself and uh, Andras were based here at SOAS and these two people are based at the University of Surrey. So that's a joint project between SOAS and the University of Surrey. Uh, the project is not exclusively about Tundra Nenets, okay? but Tundra Nenets is one of our target languages. Uh, and the reason it's there in this project is that it demonstrates this phenomenon of prominent internal possessors, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, so, since we do have a mixed audience here, people who are linguists and people who are not linguists, I'll try to explain it in very non-technical terms, in a very simple language, so to say. So, what is it about? Well, it's about basically about possessive constructions, and as we know, uh, possessive constructions you know, standard possessive constructions involve two elements, uh, the, pos the possessed noun and the possessor, right? Uh, so in this English phrase, Mary's children, the possessed noun children, and the possessor Mary, obviously, yeah? And usually in linguistics we say that the possessed noun um, is the head of the phrase and the possessor is the dependent. What does it, well it means a lot, a lot of different things but it, in particular it means that the, this part, the head element, is more prominent in syntax uh, with respect to many different phenomena. Okay, uh, that's, that's why it's the head of the phrase. What are these phenomena? Well, there are two phenomena we are looking at. First, the head normally determines agreement on the verb. Right, so we can, in English we can say Mary's children are sleeping. What you cannot say, you cannot say Mary's children is sleeping. Because if you have is, it will agree with, with, with the non-head element. And what we do need, we need agreement with the, with the head element. That's how English works and that's how most other languages work. So that's one phenomenon. Another phenomenon where the notion of head is extremely important is what uh, ling linguists call uh, switch reference. But uh, if you use non-technical language, it's basically what determines the identity of the subject, no subject. So in English you can say, Mary's children played while waiting. And who is waiting here? Well, obviously children. You cannot understand the sentence that Mary was waiting, right? So this zero, is controlled by children, again by the head of the possessive phrase. And in English, in English you cannot understand it, that, that, that the, possessed, uh, the possessor controls agreement. However, and most languages are like that, the notion of head is extremely important in grammatical theory, as, as, as you know, and in fact many uh, syntactic theories are kind of built around this notion of head. However, interestingly, there are languages where this strict relationship is violated and Tundranens happens to be one of them. So in these languages it's precisely this kind of structure uh, which would be possible unlike in English. So you would say something like Mary's children is sleeping where the verb is will um, cross-reference Mary, the possessor rather than the possessed. Okay and that's what yeah, that's what I basically said. Uh, there are languages where this kind of structure is possible, or this kind of structure is possible. Mary's children played while waiting, and waiting would uh, refer to Mary rather than children. Okay. So what is happening here is that the possessor behaves more prominently in syntax than the possessed noun contrary to what we would expect uh, from the normal syntactic assumptions. And that's what we call prominent internal possessors. Because this, these possessors, they remain internal to the noun phrase, but they show some signs of prominence, syntactic prominence outside of the noun phrase. 
And that's what we decided to, to study within this project. Um, I have to say that there are not that many languages which have these features, but there are some languages and they are genetically unrelated. They come from different parts of the globe. Tundranen ha happens to be one of them. Um, yeah, so we call this phenomenon prominent internal possessor, possessors or PIPs. That's our acronym which we use. And, there, uh, and this phenomenon is very interesting. Uh, well, it, it's interesting in many different respects, uh, but it's interesting for grammatical theory for two main reasons. Well, the first reason is the notion of head. It kind of challenges uh, this very basic assumption of syntactic theory that uh, syntax is based around the notion of head. Because here we have a clear example uh, when a non-head element shows some prominence features, in a sense, more prominent than the head element. And this, of course, raises the question, do we actually need such a stri strict division between the head and the dependent? Maybe there are some degrees of headedness, right? Uh, how do we actually conceptualize it in syntactic theory? So that's one theoretical reason why uh, this, um, this stuff is... Uh, challenging uh, for grammatical theory. And the second reason is that also raises the questions uh, about the nature of the agreement relation and the nature of the switch reference relation. Do these relations work on sort of on structural configurations only or maybe they refer to some other levels of representation. So for example we have evidence that in the languages where you do have this PIPs phenomenon, the possessor, which behaves prominently in syntax, it's also functionally prominent. It means that it has some special level of, uh, you know, importance uh, uh, for the speaker, or topicality, or some other feature. Uh, and if your relationship of um, agreement or switch reference target this prominent possessor, we might want to ask, is it a purely structural relationship or maybe it targets functional uh, information? So that's, these are all very central uh, questions for grammatical, for, syn for syntactic theory. And that's why the study of these languages is actually uh, important for the linguistic theory in general. Right. Uh, so, th these are the goals of our, of our project. Um, the first go goal is to present a systematic cross-linguistic study of the PIP phenomenon, right? And as I said, we do have uh, quite a few languages which show it from different parts of the world. On the world, in, in terms of geography, a lot of languages um, from no sort of northern India, Nepal area have this phenomenon. They're in the Aryan languages and some Tibetan Burman languages. Um, also, some Turkic languages uh, do have this phenomenon. Some languages of uh, South America, okay? Uh, that's what we found so far. Uh, but there are more. So, sporadically, they appear here and there uh, around, around the globe. So, the, uh, first, we are going to collect as much information about this phenomenon as possible. And second, we are going to present a detailed case studies of four target languages. And as you can see, Tundranenets is one of them. But we also have Turkish, which is, of course, a well studied and a big language. But it, it, surprisingly, this phenomenon in Turkish hasn't been studied very much, which was really uh, an amazing discovery for us, given that there are, you know, many Turkish grammars and plenty of syntaxicians who study this language, but uh, n not many people uh, paid attention to this, okay? That, that, uh, that language, it was actually the first language where this phenomenon was discovered, if you, if you like, it's an, in the Aryan language. And it has a very interesting system of agreement uh, which can be controlled by various elements, including the possessors. And finally, this isolated isolate language from Bolivia, Chimane, which also ha have the same, has the same phenomenon. So these are our target languages, and for these languages we actually do field work uh, and uh, work with the language consultants. As a, okay. 
So what are we planning to reach at the end, right? Several um, uh, research outputs. Well, first of all, we do uh, we did have this workshop on prominent internal possessors here at SOAS a couple of months ago, which I, I thought was quite well attended for two 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 day days event. And then, of course, we are going to publish papers, uh, including a volume w uh, which will be based on the materials presented in this workshop. And I'm very uh, happy to say that the proposal has been accepted by Oxford University Press just recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we are now collecting papers and hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully it will be published in a year or two. And there will also be a database um, um, which will be um, publicly available and uh, fully queryable for various uh, variables related to this phenomenon. It will be hosted by the University of Surrey, uh, which, as you know, is maybe is very good at creating typological databases. Okay, so they have very, very detailed tools of how, how to deal with this kind of material. And uh, this database on PIPs will be added to their existing data, databases. Yeah, so that, that, that's our goal and we still have, um, well, almost two years to go. And, uh, but I guess the main um, message which I wanted to pass here is that you know, looking at the, these languages, uh, you can, uh, the languages which are not really studied very well, you can really discover amazing uh, phenomena which are really, really relevant for the general theory of how language should look like. And I guess the study of this phenomena is the only ac valid academic reason of dealing with languages uh, which are endangered. Yeah, I guess that's my main message. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Are you going back to Tundra anytime soon? <laughs> 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 no, um, probably not because we actually uh, uh, have a, a possibility to invite the consultants, uh, well not here but to Finland where I have a couple of colleagues which, uh, who also work on, on the same language. So we usually have fieldwork sessions there and it's been working quite well I have to say. And consultants are very happy to, to go there and I'm quite happy <laughs> to go there too. Yeah, and it's uh, a, a bit better in terms of working conditions because if you go there, people are usually busy with their lives uh, and you don't really want to intervene too, too, too much. And since I'm not recording any uh, natural communicative events or anything like that, it doesn't really matter for me if I, if I work within the community or outside. outside. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, as you say, it's key to what you're saying. You know, Mary's children is waiting or whatever. But in the, this particular language, how do they then actually make clear that it's the children that are waiting? The possessed. How do they make? Do they have to have a special Oh, but um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in fact. Um, in all languages which have this phenomenon, this is not the only way of expressing possessive construction. There is always a choice. Okay, that's just one of the available possess possessive constructions. But uh, you can use non-PIP construction, which will be pretty much the same as English. Okay, so they exist in parallel, so to say. And that this, of course, raises further question: Why do you need this at all? And that's where all these fun functional factors, which I mentioned, play a role. Yeah, yeah, that's also a good question. Um, actually, yes, and actually in Tundra Nenets, it turns out that peeps, uh, well, first of all, they beha behave like clausal arguments in, ter uh, in terms of the switch reference, but they also behave like clausal arguments 
in terms of control of reflexivization, for example, right? Uh, which is kind of amazing, given that the possessor still stays inside the noun phrase, and that's the only uh, sub clause level element which can behave uh, this way in terms of reflexivization control. Yeah. Also, I have a suspicion, we haven't looked at it very much yet, but I have a suspicion they may be more accessible to relativization than non-PIP possessors. Yeah. So there is a range of phenomena where they clearly show some kind of syntactic prominence. Yeah. Yeah? Okay, thank you. <laughs>